So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining. Is it too, too loud, right? Uh, English or Italian? Engl English or Italian, what's your preference? English. Okay, nice. So yeah, welcome again uh, to everyone for uh, staying this late for our talk. It, this is gonna be like a little bit of a lighter talk in, uh, with respect to the other one that you already uh, have enjoyed so far. So we're gonna be talking about an experiment, an Android-based experiment that we've been doing, uh, me and Simone. I am Emanuele Di Saverio. Simone Lipolis. Yeah, Simone Lipolis. Colleagues at Frog, uh, Frog Design. Um, so we did this experiment around drones and VR, and we want to share with you our experience and what we've, we've been up to, and also the challenges, just challenges that we faced. So if you want to do something similar, then you can. You are up to speed. Okay, again, uh, this is us. So we are colleagues at Frog. Uh, basically, principal design technologies, senior design technologies, we do the same work. Uh, dealing with technology, especially in this case, mobile and, and web frontend. What is uh, Frog? Frog is a um, global design strategy firm, I guess. So we've been involved in designing uh, a lot of stuff back in, from the 67th. Uh, when Frog was founded, among those also you don't make to back in the days uh, for Apple. And, uh, but this is not what we're gonna be talking today. What we'll be talking today is an effort that we did during our, let's say, fun time, or sp uh, spare time, in which we actually enjoy you know, doing some uh, installation, some um, um, uh, code uh, mashup, just to uh, first, exercise our, our uh, creativity and also um, uh, for marketing purposes, of, of course, and also for, uh, for the, some event. In this case, it is the Salone del Mobile event, which is happening this week. Uh, this is the stuff that we did for last year's Salone, and you will see stuff that we did for the last, last year's Salone and other stuff. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, so I, I give you a brief introduction on why we did this experiment. Uh, and like the slide says, we, everything started on a, on a Black Friday. We honestly didn't know what a Black Friday is until Amazon arrived in Italy. So we were browsing on Amazon and we found these toys like super discounted. And uh, so we, we, we thought, okay, we can try it. We can try to buy it. We want to try to play with it. And also I have, two young kids, uh, so I, I wanted them to play with it and, and to see their reactions. This video is an ad from uh, Parrot, and you, you see, it, it's very fun. These this very, very small toys can do a lot of things, uh, are super fun, but the fun lasts 20 minutes. Like, the first time your battery discharges and one battery lasts 20 minutes, then you cannot do anything more than what you see here. And I must be honest, in, in the real life, you will not be able to do that kind of tricks. So we, we thought, okay, we, have, we, we, spend a lot of, we spend some money on this thing. Uh, we want to have fun with it. We have to find a way to make them more entertaining. And we, we have to find a way to create something that can be shared, a fun that can be shared with other people. And so we started thinking what we can do, what, what is the correct way to make them more fun, and the first answer has been uh, we need to make it a multi-user game. So if you drive them alone, it's not funny. You have to, to find a way to involve more people and uh, thinking and brainstorming with this uh, idea, Super Mario Kart came, uh, came to our help. And uh, it has everything that we needed. It's multi-user, it has a speed, it has a little dose of violence, uh, and almost everyone knows, knows it, knows how it works. So it will be very, very easy to explain other people how to play our game. And this is the, the, the base where, uh, where we started. And this slide shows uh, how we evolved the, 
normal toy, which is a super uh, technological toy, but it's nothing more than a toy. And uh, we evolved it and changed it and turned it into a super aggressive uh, racer, more or less. I mean, and later, if you want to have a look at the, at the shields and the covers that we built, they are here on the table. And this slide also represents uh, what happened uh, starting from the normal drone to the race to a lot of people having fun. Because we started this as a like, side project and we ended up uh, holding um, a real race during last year's Salone del Mobile event. So we had around 100 people playing with these toys and racing once, one against the others and at the end having fun, because it was fun. And this video shows a little bit of the story of our experiment. So we, how we started, and uh, as, as you can see, we, we, we worked a lot, because uh, we, we have been forced to face a lot of different problems that are not necessarily related to the to the technology or to the code involved, but to a lot of elements that represent the user experience. Like uh, during our test, we, we understood, understood that we needed to create some boundaries for the, for the racetrack, because uh, using the um, first person view on the phone, it was really, really hard to understand where the track was. So we involved our uh, our industrial design team to create the truck. We involved our industrial design team to create the covers, the visual design team to create the colors, and we did really a lot of different tests, but at the end it worked. And I mean, we're pretty proud of it. Um, during our journey, we had to face these three problems that you can see here. So we had to find a way to allow the drones to talk to each other because every one of these is a single user toy. We had to find a way to allow them to sense each other. So allowing one drone to recognize the other drones in, uh, in, its, in its view. And we had to like, optimize the code to make it work better and to make it work in, a, in an acceptab acceptable way to allow people to, to play with us. And now the code is like too hard for me. <laughs> okay, so these are the three uh, topics that we're gonna talk about uh, that we worked a lot upon. You see, working, driving the, the drone, that means. No. Uh, so we have these three problems. So th let's go to the first one. So talk, talk to each other. As uh, Simone was saying, these tools here are configured to broadcast their, their own Wi-Fi network. So how it works out of the box is that you actually connect to the Wi-Fi of the drone with an application that you download from the Play Store and you drive it. So what's the problem is that after you have, you have uh, used up your Wi-Fi to connect to here, then you're not connected to the internet anymore. So we're, talk we're talking about Android 5 and 6, so there was no way to actually keep two connections open. So you would actually lose any possibility to communicate with others. So we need to find a way around that. So how we set this up is basically each of the drone actually is, is uh, controlled by an application that's on a phone that we need to do record from scratch. So like that, you will see like a little animation about the application and the design of the application. Uh, it is connected and connecting the drone, but the drone connects to a normal Wi-Fi network, while the phone itself also connects to a normal Wi-Fi network. That enables us from the phone to actually have internet connection and have a central uh, game server to hold the game state. Because you can think that any, you can think about that any interaction between the different drones actually needs to be relayed by a server. So we need a way to connect to the internet. Then in this case, there was a simple Node.js server uh, that was hosted uh, on IDS that Simona took care about. Uh, so first thing is uh, hacking the connection. So uh, these tools are very simple, but actually very hackable. It's possible to turn it into the actual drone, uh, Wi-Fi, and basically access to the Linux system that is underlying. So you can configure it after a lot of trial and error 
configured to connect to a simple, even five gigahertz, but uh, it needs to be without um, password. So a free, an, an open Wi-Fi that is actually a normal Wi-Fi. So you edit the configuration in a way that all the code will be uh, made available, of, of course, is already available on, on, on GitHub. So you can check out how to do this. So to connect to your Wi-Fi and have them um, uh, you know, uh, enjoy also the extended range of wi Wi-Fi and being able to, to actually have them connect all together on the same Wi-Fi. Um, and then, enables, as I was mentioning before, enables us to actually have a broker server. We call it broker because basically the game is actually simple. What he actually does is routing events from one play player to another. If a player tries to shoot another player with the command, then of course you need to notify the, the player that's been hit that actually it was it. So it's basically like a, a broker service, you know, like a traffic cop here, routing events here and there. Then you, of course, we do it with the web sockets, so you can scale to one billion users, but we only have four players at the time, so that makes it not really important. Um, we do it because we want it. So the second problem, this basically at this point you have um, a network setup in which you actually connect the phone to the Wi-Fi and the drone to the Wi-Fi. Still, there is no way for the actually drone, for their drone to actually understand when are the other players. So, um, there are many um, uh, choices for, for uh, indoor location, so you may recognize some of these technologies that we actually took um, into consideration. Uh, so the Tango one, the Project Tango of course requires scanning of the, of the, of the environment, so it was not good for us. Uh, of course, the Bluetooth-based one is not very precise. This, was, this is a real-time game. You want a precision that is under you know, one centimeter, otherwise you are not able to hit one each other. So it's not um, an actual uh, feasible strategy. The other strategy, which is the one that is used by the VR system, ER system around there, like the HTC Vive, is the infrared marker, like you see Peter Jackson uh, using in the, while shooting the, 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 the Hobbit, in which you basically have some uh, beacon cameras that actually shoot um, triangulated signals to um, um, a repeater which are these white balls there so the, the signal bounce back and you can have an actual accurate, accurate me measurement of the location. This also was not possible because it requires a lot of money to buy actually the actual infrared camera. So we could use, we could go for the cheap route as we uh, like be real hackers and use something that is on board of the drone which is the webcam that is in front. Now, of course, um, the webcam um, is good for you know, shooting your movies when, when you're playing around with your kids, as, as Simone was saying, but it's also possible to stream the actual frame to the phone. So you actually got each and, single, each single, each and every single frame that is coming from the, from the uh, webcam itself can be broadcast through Wi-Fi to your phone. These are the specs of the camera. They are nothing spectacular. Of course, these are the... the the preview mode spec, which is the one that we need to use for real-time uh, game, like the hour, so uh, the resolution is abysmal, and the uh, frame per second is actually quite slow, uh, but that value dictates, will dictate actually our, the pace of our, our, um, our, uh, our code, basically. That, 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 is our, that is our maximum rate. It's fixed focus, that means that it only works at a given distance. If you go too far, it goes out of focus. And the, the, the format is motion JPEG. <clears throat> motion JPEG basic, uh, basically means that you are um, uh, streamed single frame, each and every single frame. They are not compressed like, I don't know, uh, with YUV format. Each and, and every single frame, it's a, it's a different JPEG, which means that you will need, if you do the calculation for 15 frames per second, you will quickly understand that you need a lot of, of bandwidth for trans, uh, uh, sending even that resolution through the actual Wi-Fi for multiple players. So what are we actually seeing with this uh, webcam then? So we tried with different uh, choices also here. Uh, the first thing that I wanted is basically being able to recognize like a distinctive shape, uh, we tried with color blobs. So um, we wanted to associate like a little ball maybe on top of each of the, of the drone and being able to detect the blob of color that you are, being, um, you are, you are seeing. So again, just to repeat, the, the drone broadcasts the frame to the actual 
phone, and the phone does, of course, all the heavy lifting because this is where our code lies. So we have um, been applying this technique here, for example. This code uh, is the one that enables the color blob re recogni um, um, uh, recognition. Is it has been um, manually optimized for our, yeah, for our, sorry, let me, by, let me go down, uh, for our uh, webcam and our characteristics. Of, of course, you need to optimize for your camera. And this is based on OpenCV, but it, it didn't work in the end. You will see this code if you want to look up how to do simple and get started with the simple, you know, um, uh, computer vision stuff. This is a very uh, good place to start. But you see that the class is not used because we found out that there are some problems on this too. The actual color blob works fine and for a given light condition. It turns out that when the light condition changes, as for example in a party, which is exactly our, our setup, the color is not, uh, let's say that the signal that is detected by the webcam is not good anymore. And you got problems in uh, fuzziness in the um, detection of the centroid of the color blob. So we need to do something that is more, um, this, is, this explains a little bit what you're seeing, something that is more robust. So these are called fiducial markers. So you see there are high contracts, contrast and um, hemming distance encoded shapes. That means they look like a bar, uh, um, um, what's called, uh, a QR code, thank you. Uh, they are much simpler, of course. Uh, you see they hold less, less uh, data, oops. And they work in a similar way. This is a, a, a sketch of the algorithms. So basically, you pass out contour recognition on an image. You transform the image so that to have this um, uh, rectang rectangle, actually, it's like a trapezoid, become a square. And then you, uh, let's say, pixelize the framework, the, the, the image that you get, in order to detect one of the IDs. This is what the algorithm is uh, in a nutshell. Of course, there are frameworks that do that for us. In this, example, in this uh, case, I actually leveraged AR Toolkit, which is a simple open source framework that you can find. There are other options, also commercial options. Um, I leveraged this one because it was uh, easy to actually customize. And I also had to delve into the framework code to actually hack it a little bit to have it for our uh, work for our case. Because, of course, this is an AR framework. Is it uh, studied for putting up 3D shapes on a 3D environment. What we don't want, what we want is just the location, the, the, the recognition part. We want to know on our image where are the actual fiducial markers. So this is basically uh, the game, a screenshot of the game as it was coded, and again in the application, which is part of the, the let's say the, the big uh, source code part. You basically drive the, your your uh, your drone by tilting the phone. You got uh, a gas pedal uh, for accelerating, of, of course, and it was also nice because especially these models here, they have plenty of power, so they go pretty fast. So you're not always, you know, 100%. You need to slow down otherwise, especially in the beginning. They also have the reverse, and they have a fire, a fire button. When you are in the target uh, area, the actual algorithm detects that you are in the center, nearby to the center, and it, it shoots up like a hit message to the uh, Node.js server, who actually broadcasts to the losing player who gets a penalty. Namely, spins up and he loses a lot of time and hopefully loses the race. Okay, so again, one step below. How does it work, the actual Emacs processing uh, pipeline? So there is an SDK from Parrot that is given to you for actually controlling the drone. And this is the SDK that actually gives you the frame. So you get the frame in input. It is basically, um, um, a bitmap, a JPEG, so when you, um, let's say, decode it, it's actually a bitmap, but this is not the right format that is good for the AR toolkit. You need to re-encode it in YUV. And re-encoding a bitmap, even though not big one, is actually something that impacts on your frame rate. So for doing this thing, we had to delve into, to have acceptable uh, performances, we had to delve into this strange beast that maybe some of you know, it's render script. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, we are um, uh, converting images to YUV using going down basically to an uh, intermediate format of, of C. I was not expert in render script. I know something about it, so I had to study it up. And also, it's very difficult to debug. But again, it's another thing that I learned thanks to this project. So you can pass it to the ER toolkit. 
uh, the Yartuk it then is, uh, does its magic, it gives you back the 3D coordinates in this 3D world. The 3D world that it has depends on the tilting on the phone, because of course it's an AR, an AR framework, so it will be higher if the phone is tilted like that. So you want to do some math for unwinding that, because you don't care, you only want a 2D point, as projected on the screen. There's also some you know, matrix multiplication magic, and some uh, magic number as well that I had to put inside. In order to get a reasonably ac accurate 2D uh, position, that means that you will have, uh, you see, yeah, you will have this X and Y coordinated in. All of this needs to happen in 66 milliseconds. Why? Because basically we got a parot SDK that gives you 50, 15 frames per second, so you got 66 milliseconds to process it before the new frame comes. No? And that looks simple enough. Uh, Real-time game, you have to adopt a lot of the techniques that are actually uh, proper or uh, pertaining to, to games itself. So, uh, you know, Java implementation for some of the, of the, of the <laughs> algorithms is just too slow. So we, this is like a little performance uh, comparison that I was doing about, you know, doing with render script or doing with, uh, on the JVM the same algorithm. I was translating, you know, the, the, the actual two languages. And um, the, the problem, of course, it's the, it's, the creation, it's the creation of the intermediate format that we are pouring from native to uh, Java because they are two different uh, memory spaces and then back. So you have a lot of these. The, for the first implementation you do, you may be uh, familiar with this. This is the memory profiler. You create a lot, you, I mean, you are an object-oriented program. You create a lot of objects. No, you can't do not even that. We are in a game, so it means that we are basically developing a game, so you need to stay away from objects. Stay away actually not from objects, but from, ob from memory allocation. Each memory allocation implies that at some point there will be also a garbage collection. Every time there's a garbage collection, you got a 10 millisecond freeze. And when you got a 10 millisecond freeze, well, it depends, of course, on the algorithm that, that you have. There are modern Android versions that are faster, but the older Android version could even be longer. It means that while you're driving, you got luck. And that is exactly the way to bump into a wall, into the wall. Because you're trying to steer, but the actually steering comes, I don't know, 100 milliseconds late, boom. It's the, the issue that we have in, with games. If you get lag on a multiplayer game, you can't play. So the actual harder, better, faster, stronger, uh, let's say, section is actually making it playable. Because if it's not fast enough, it's simply useless. So you can't create bitmap, you can't create big arrays, you can't create uh, objects, and you have to pay attention when you out of box the integers. So integer is a native type in, uh, in, uh, in Java, but if you use it like as a, uh, in, in HashMap or, or in some places that requires an object as an argument, Java will create an object, a uh, wrapper object, uh, under the covers, and it won't tell you. You will just realize that you got a lot of these spikes, like chain, uh, uh, jigsaw uh, in your memory utilization. And I need to work hard to actually even it out and uh, reaching the, the one that is below that. So basically a steady increase uh, and uh, slow, um, small pauses, pauses of the GC. This is the actual full control flow. Let's go back to the algorithm itself. The one that I showed you, it was actually a simple one, um, a simple version, but the actual uh, full game is more complex than that. We only saw the top part but actually, of course, you, you have uh, the game state to keep, to keep track about now. You got um, network events, so if you are hit, you receive a message from the network that actually tells you you are hit. Um, if you are using the gas pedal and you're changing it, you receive a message as, as well. You need, to game, you need to change the game state, you need to, you need to update the, the SDK of the power to actually you know, accelerate or steer the, the drone, and you need to also update the user interface. So what happens is all these events happens at very different period, you know, uh, frequencies. So you can have uh, the, a new frame that comes every 66 milliseconds, but you got the user interface that you want to update at 16, 16 milliseconds, so 60 frames per second, uh, because you want to have a smooth graphics, of course. We want, everybody wants, wants that. Usually when you control the actual um, uh, uh, car with the sensor, uh, like uh, with the remote control, then you got a new event every 50 milliseconds, 
And then you got maybe an event every 50 seconds. They are like a, a network event that tells you you are hit or you're being hit or you're being slowed down, these kind of events. So these are all different um, uh, time, you know, time intervals that can, in which an event, an event can happen. And you don't know when. So, of course, this is a new way. Maybe you'll be, I know that there have been in the last two or three years a lot of, uh, you know, talks and um, uh, interest about RxJava, about Reactive. But this is a, um, a field of uh, application that maybe you didn't think about. All these events actually can, can happen at any time. You need to synchronize and be asynchronous on each and every of them. Now, if you do it serially, this will be like a procedural game group to do that. If you do like that, you first acquire the image, you need to wait 66 milliseconds, you get the process marker, wait 36 milliseconds, you get the input from the steering, 50 milliseconds, and you end up with being unable to play. So everything, each one of these needs to be an independent queue. And if you need to code a different independent queue for that, you can get crazy. That's just, just, uh, just a simple truth. So, Rx Java gives uh, uh, us uh, a very good hand over that. Um, yeah, you know everything about this, I think, by, end of, by now you've been having a lot of very good talks, to, even today, and I re read yesterday. So Rx Java is actually uh, a must, in uh, my, my opinion. I will show you some code here. Regarding, uh, yeah. So, for example, of course, when we are streaming, when there is a new frame uh, from the webcam incoming, then it's a byte array. Uh, this is uh, you will uh, the language is Scotland, but so you you don't see you don't see just because it's Scotland. Um, so this is actually an observable itself. So uh, you can subscribe to it and start receiving um, uh, bitmaps. So you can actually subscribe also to the events of, this, of the steering wheel. Again, another observable. And an, another very useful class that you don't know about and very useful in these cases are both connectable observable that you invite you to go. Basically, it's an observable that you create and it doesn't start speeding out events right away. Only when you connect, it starts speeding out the next event. It's like a steady event of streams, and when you connect, it starts getting you the next one. And another one that is very useful is the subject. So it's basically a source of, of observable events. And it, it's something that, that was very useful to me, and I use this somewhere. You will, you will see in the code if you are interested in how to use that. So in the end, what this enables us to, to, to write is that the actual core of the coordination of all these independent contexts is actually very simple. Meaning that we got a byte array and, and a bitmap producer. This basically gives you a bitmap every 36 milliseconds. I'm pacing this, meaning that I don't want, you know, for um, avoiding uh, jitter in the, in the game, uh, you need to have like a steady uh, update of the game. If you go too fast, but only some time, then it's a bad playing experience. So we make sure that we get a sample of the event every 36 milliseconds. Doing this by end, I would already put a lot of bugs just for doing this. So getting an event every 36 milliseconds and not faster than that. And then we can, of course, process the image. This is the color detector in which we actually use it as a filter in Rx Java. So pass the actual bitmap to a color detector. And what it's, uh, it's spit out is basically um, uh, this callback in which you actually get the position and update the game state. Again, also the driving of, of, the, uh, of the actual uh, drone is based on Alex Java. So you got, again, stream, subscribe, uh, battery level, so when the battery is low, this kind of, uh, the battery of the drone, because we're talking, of course, not the one of the, of the, of the phone. Is the drone that actually has a 15 minutes, uh, um, you know, uh, autonomy? I don't know if autonomy is direct uh, English word, but okay. After uh, 15 minutes, you need to charge them back again. So you want to know when it's uh, going down. And uh, again, it, I took the chance also to experiment a little bit with Kotlin as well, because of course, you know, with all these callbacks, 
with all this, um, um, uh, you know, asynchronous code, you end up using a lot of callbacks. Of course, with uh, new Android supporting Java 8, this is less of an issue, but still, there are a lot of constructs in the language that make me think that this is the best, uh, a very good uh, way forward uh, for, for, for Android as well. Uh, these are the three main points that I think uh, are make it very good for Android, uh, the overhead, the closures, and interoperability with Java. The thing that I still, I don't know, maybe uh, you guys can give me your, your experience over that, is the nullability. Of course, it takes a very type-based approach to nullability, so everything can be either a string or a nullable string if it's something that can be null. It's a way to fight null, of course, and it's very good in general, but uh, SDKs like Android and also iOS one, they base upon null as a, as a value. So you, in a way, you're fighting, fighting a little bit the actual framework, and you end up having a lot of question mark, uh, explanation, exclamation mark over the code just to get from the code of Android, which is messy and null dependent, to an actually code that is null free, which is yours. So it may be worth, it may be not. This is mostly what I want to talk to you about. This is a slide with the sponsor, in a way. <laughs> yeah, Parrot was very kind in uh, giving us, you know, drones and batteries for support and the framework that we've been using. And um, yeah, so basically the code is available on GitHub there if you want to check out how to actually start over. There are a lot of uh, future development that can start from this uh, project. So for example, integrating in a first person virtual reality visor, you, it would be uh, an immediate one, having support for more, for more drones, all this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that you can actually uh, there's also an article that we published, uh, and for the part that you didn't see, uh, so the actual racetrack and the design, Federico and Elena also helped us, our colleagues in Frog Design. And I think that we got a couple of, uh, yeah, uh, you know, nice images from the night that we had in the Frog Design in Milano. By the way, uh, if you didn't come uh, you know, Wednesday, you lost another great party. Uh, but it was in Milan. So you see all the racetrack that was, of course, I mean, it's not matter for Android, for an Android conference, but I can tell that it was really fun to actually build just the track with cardboard and, uh, you know, designing the actual track with the uh, lights and everything. And a lot of people had fun, so I wanted to share this uh, with you. And um, I think we're done.